What is up, theology nerds? This is Trip, and you're listening to Homebrew Christianity, where since the year of 2008, we've been bringing you ideological ingredients so you can brew your own faith. And today on the podcast is processed feminist theologian Helene Russell. We're going to talk about uh, falling in love theologically with uh, Soren Kierkegaard. We're going to talk about how she went process in her theological education. Um, we're going to talk about trauma and uh, a process understanding of trauma and, and embodied uh, existence and, and what all that looks like when you start to nerd out thinking about those topics. And Helene is here. This episode is sponsored by Christian Theological Seminary, which is the very location that Helene is theologian. So you'll hear more about that in a minute. But uh, before we jump into the episode, I want to give a little invite to a few things. Those of you that are listening um, on the date of release, the 13th of January, uh, tomorrow we're having a live stream with uh, Adam Clark, who taught the Black Theology class with me uh, at Homebrewed, and Jeffrey C. Pugh, who taught the Bonhoeffer class. Uh, they will be joining and we'll be doing a theological debrief of everything going along, going on these days in the United States. Uh, if, you, if this has already happened, check the feed. I'm sure there's an edited version for you to listen to. Also, uh, in March and February, or February and March, uh, on those two months, Thomas J. Ord and I will be doing an online class, which is pay what you can, between zero and a million dollars. We will ta- we'll not take more than a million, and no less than zero. Um, but it is going to explore each line of the historic Christian creed, the Apostles' Creed, the early one uh, in the early church. We're going to give open and relational interpretations, exceed just exactly, uh, uh, you know, how we engage them as uh, open and relational theologians. You can sign up at openrelationaltheology.com. Um, but here's here's the other thing. If you want to get invites to all the webinars, all the live streams, all the happy hours, all the classes, you want all the content for it to show up in your feed, you can be a Homebrewed member. You just go to homebrewedcommunity.com. And you can get access to like 150 previous episodes or lessons from classes or lectures and things I've done. And you'll get access to all sorts of goodies because you get to contribute to making this possible. You get uh, invited into the private Facebook group, access to all these old classes. It's a wonderful place to be. So think about it. Homebrewedcommunity.com. And uh, with all that, with all that said, here's a little note. From Christian Theological Seminary, our podcast partner for the week, followed by my chat with Helene Russell. This is Nathan Day Wilson at Christian Theological Seminary, here to tell you about an exciting new podcast with leading thinkers on the future of theological education in the United States and its broader impact. Listen to Imagining the Future of Theological Education, beginning January the 19th, at cts.edu slash imagine or on your favorite podcast provider. Hello, everybody. This is Trip, and today on the podcast is a friend of mine, uh, Helene Russell, who is a systematic theologian at Christian Theological Seminary, and uh, I'm super pumped to have you uh, back on the podcast. Thanks. I'm excited to be here. I've got a little bird in my shirt here, you know, because that's where she likes to stay warm. Well, um, for those oh. that are just listening, they're missing out. But, um, it, you know, not everyone's bird has their own Facebook page. That's true. One of the places I think that would be good to begin um, is for you to share a bit about how you became a Christian theologian. Like, what was your kind of story of faith and your intellectual journey? At what point did they kind of intersect vocationally and uh, send you off on your uh, nerdy ways? Yeah, that's a that's kind of an interesting story, I think, because when I was a when I, you want to ask me when did you decide you wanted to be a theologian? I think it was when I was about four, and my mother told me about the story because I don't even remember it. Um, that I we had these old um, antique desks, you know, where you have the desk here and then a little ink well and then the seat there. And then, yeah. So and I would, um, put my, um, stuffed animals, which I didn't actually have teddy bears. I had others kind of stuffed animals, but anyway, 
I would put them on there and they would, my mother had a lot of books because my mother went to seminary. Um, she went to seminary with, uh, at Harvard Divinity School, actually a long time ago in the fifties. She was the only woman there. Um, and she ended up having lots of copies like you probably do, um, multiple copies of the same book, you know, like Tillich, Kierkegaard, uh, Wesley stuff. She's Methodist. Anyway, so when she had lots of copies of them, I would give, for some reason, they had to have their own copy, the stuffed animals, and then I would teach. Okay, and that's funny. That's funny. <laughs> Your stuffed animals, they have a favorite text. Like, did they come alive with, like, shaking the foundations or? Yes, definitely. Know. And certainly Dynamics of Faith. I still yeah. have about eight copies of Dynamics of Faith. Fear yeah. and Trembling, or is that too angsty for? Uh... Yeah, we had. Yeah, I think it was more of a book on Kierkegaard rather than Fear and Trembling, but. I mean, it, you know, and I remember telling my mother when I was older that I wanted to be a professor. And she said, well, of course you do, darling. I knew that when you were four and started teaching your stuffed animals in the basement. Um, but it was so it was it, it was so funny that they all had to have the same book. Like I could only teach the the, the book that they all they had several copies of. Um, but, you know. So in some odd way, uh, it contributes to the ease of teaching in the middle of the teaching because you're all just my stuffed animals, right? <laughs> uh, but <laughs> I, you know, and then I then I came to Claremont, you know, and I I I actually thought when I was in Claremont that I would do something that brought together counseling and theology, uh, which I ended up just doing the theology portion. And um, Claremont in California, of course, you, famous Claremont, um, which now is not there. I mean, the, the town's still there, but the school isn't or the seminary isn't. Anyway, so um, I went there and started learning theology. And actually, I didn't jump into process theology right at first. In fact, I was a little resistant of it. Um, I was really into the, you know, the 19th century Kierkegaard. And Paul Tillich still, um, and then I started to be interested in process, in process thought, and in feminist thought, um, particularly when Marjorie came along. Um, but you know, I think that there's something in the water at Claremont that just feeds you whitehead, <laughs> like it, you just start to learn it more. Just even if you're not taking classes, you just kind of everyone talks that way, so you start absorbing it. Um, yeah. So does that answer well, your question? Yeah. And I mean, th that's funny example, like, th you know, that there's enough people familiar with Whitehead at Claremont. You don't have to decide you want to learn it to end up learning it. Um, yeah. and it gives you a vision of the world in the same way, like most people that grow up in the church, their formation and their own Christian identity, is something they kind of grow into because they're around the stories and the liturgy and, and the things, and they're the language and symbols and stories they use to make sense of existence and their identity um, and stuff. And it, it's just most of the time you don't go anywhere in the world where there's a large collection of philosophers that are into Alfred North Whitehead so much that Everybody is, uh, you know, adjacently familiar and you can say the word concrescence without having to explain it, you know? Yeah, exactly. And <laughs> wish people happy actual occasions for their birthday. <laughs> yes. So um, what, you know, uh, you know, it's interesting when you share about your mom being one of the first female students at Harvard Divinity School and growing up in a home where, you're they're handing books that plenty of people would you know discover in seminary and then their parents are like you're reading Paul Tillich that's down the slippery slope to you know somewhere bad um can you kind of describe uh what uh that relationship between kind of questions doubts challenges to faith looked like in a space where you had a pioneering mother um and the the intellectual quest the uh, affirmation of uh, female dignity and things were never competitions to the faith, but, you know, kind of uh, all celebrated in unison. Yeah. Well, um, you know, I remember going to seminary and going to some kind of uh, retreat thing at Claremont 
And I remember Mary, uh, not Tyler, Elizabeth Moore, Mary Elizabeth Moore, she was talking about what it was like the first time how she had a pretty emotionally powerful experience, the first time she actually saw a woman preach or give her communion. And I remember reflecting on it and thinking, yeah, I, not my, you know, I, I, I remember having men be the pastors at, when I was in college and thinking they're kind of dry and boring. Whereas my mother was fun um, as a, as a preacher and as a minister, she was, you know, she was kind of, uh, she made it much more interesting and fun. It was not dry. And I mean, it was, there was intellectual stuff. She would be talking about Tillich and that sort of thing, but she, she would often bring in great examples and we would do fun things. I remember one time we were all, we did a circus and I don't remember exactly why we did the circus, but I remember how it got, how she got it all happened. But I, it was the kids. We all did a circus. We were all different circus creatures. And I remember her whole, the whole point. And this was, I mean, I was pretty young was how do we treat people that we think are weird? Right. I mean, here we are circus, circus people. How do we treat people that we think are weird? So could we see your child because you now are looking at your child, her sermon was now you're looking at your child dressed up in a weird thing, um, you know, Jojo the dog boy or something like that. But you see your child. Could you see your child or the child that's in the person that you think is weird? Um, I mean, so it was a pretty liberal or I don't even want to use that word because people get all upset about liberal. Who, um, but it was a pretty progressive uh, approach to diversity and loving and accepting people that are different that we don't, we usually think of as, Ooh, we're they're scary or, um, you know, when we're kids or, you know, it seems like that seems to be the case more and more. Now we're, we're divided against each other. Anybody that is slightly different than, um, me is somehow scary or the enemy or, um, I mean, I think that's, you know, the message that we're trying to come up with now is how how can we imagine ourselves as connected as all from, I mean, I know you're in England, but I'm just going to say all Americans, right, right here, just using it as an example of what's going on in this country. Um, you definitely ask the question, even if you're still across the ocean. Yeah. 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 So the um uh you know you your work in uh, 19th century work and existentialism and stuff has always remained a part of your you know academic career could you could you share a bit about how it was you you know fell in love with soren and and uh and maybe for people that don't know him like what are what was the connection point in some of the ideas of his that kind of continue to inspire uh, your own reflection? Yeah, I, I loved Soren Kierkegaard, the, the so-called father of modern existentialism, who was a Dane in the 18th century or 19th century, 18, uh, eight, early 1800s. And I fell in love with him when I was probably a teenager reading his stuff down in the basement, mom's old seminary stuff and just found him to be uh, so engaging in terms of asking questions and including questions of doubt. I mean, not now you don't think of him as saying doubt, but you know, the whole notion of truth as really being about how we relating to the ideas, how we relate to the things that are most valuable that we are committed to. How, how committed are you? You know, if you say, these are what I, the things that I believe, um, then for him, truth is about how you're engaged in that. How important does it become to you? Does it, is it, is it something that you use uh, or can see at the foundation of all of the important decisions you make? Um, you know, that seems to me to be one of the things that he does so well. And he's also very engaging. I think Kierkegaard's uh, question about uh, how do you know what you know, basically, you know, I mean, he's basically saying truth is subjectivity, but what does that mean? Truth is subjectivity, meaning what do I know internally and how do I relate to the thing that I think is true? 
Do I relate to it with um, passion? Is it interesting to me? I mean, is it, it's not just something ex- interesting externally, but is it something that actually I can form my life around? Um, I, I think that's so powerful for what Kierkegaard is saying. Um, and he's, he's always got the thing that I like so much about Kierkegaard also is every time I read Kierkegaard and trust me, I've read Kierkegaard a lot. I just taught a Kierkegaard class, which was fabulous. Um, and there's always something new. There's always something. Hmm. Um, it's, it's exciting. It feels passionate. You can feel his passion, I think. Um, and even if you don't, even though I don't agree with everything he says, and I would disagree with a lot of the things externally, if you say X, Y, and Z is true, but the thing that's important is the passion um, and the questions. You know, he's asking these questions and that that weird kind of um, connection between being concerned about something. And here we're getting more into Tillich, but I think they're really getting at the same thing. Tillich talks about faith as being ultimately concerned and Kierkegaard talks about infinite passion. Um, so I'm ultimately concerned. That sounds more like anxiety and an anxiety version of passion, right? I'm concerned about something. I'm passionate about it. Uh, I think you could say similar, you could see the, the parallels there. Um, but what's really, what's so important that I'm going to affirm it even when it's in doubt, even, and, and be able to visual, uh, be able to set before me the things that I'm in doubt about, right? To not just say, oh, I'm not going to even think about that because I have to affirm this and I'm not listening to any doubts, but rather the doubt is really powerful and is Mm. heard but it doesn't overcome the love of it. It doesn't overcome how it motivates or centers uh, me. Well, one of the things about that that struck me when I first encountered Kierkegaard is that, it, well, Tillich has a line like doubt's an element of faith. Um, for Kierkegaard, that it's not just the doubt. It's that it's that, that risk of giving oneself to is inherent to it. Um, yeah. And, uh, And I just remember that uh, so many of the biggest theological questions, if they, if you haven't hung out with Kierkegaard, then you ask them and feel like your answer, if you're an evangelical might be like lining up the right Bible verses to get the right answer. Or if you're, you know, more progressive, you like line up your science, maybe references from multiple religions to get the right answer, right? I guess some like way you have trusted authorities that give you the right ideas and when, you know, after Kierkegaard, the the truth, if it really matters, if it's passionate and all those kinds of things, involves this risk that you're giving yourself to. It's much more akin to uh, a love poem than a syllogism. And I think that that insight is so important because a growing number of people in the life of the church, and I imagine you've seen this just in students that, you know, it used to be only a small percentage were out of cultural Christendom enough to be shocked by certain questions or familiar with uh, science, philosophy, these types of things that uh, you get to a type of uh, a desire for something like this kind of Kierkegaardian, uh, uh, like doubt and risk filled venture of faith. Uh, But now almost everyone does. Like if you, are not sticking your head in the sand and then saying things like Jesus is the Christ. You know, like you can't go and say, well, obviously Helene, the evidence <laughs> demands a verdict. I don't know if you know about the suffering servant song, you know, like so they, I don't, that, to me, that was the first idea where I've, I fell in love with Kierkegaard and realized, yeah, I'm glad that he was arguing against the apologist of his day. <laughs> Yeah. Well, and I, I mean, I, I think he wants to make sure we know that it's not an easy, not only is being living as a Christian, it's not easy, right? That was, that was one of his issues, but it's not easy to even affirm one's belief um, because it's paradoxical, 
Like, you know, so you can't figure it out. I mean, in some ways I, sometimes I think, you know, the, the interest in my, in the trauma work and my love of Kierkegaard have a, have a commonality in that both of them don't disregard or say that intellectual things are, are wrong. Um, but they're incomplete. They're not going to get you there. Like thinking about the trauma and talking about it isn't going to get you there, right? It's there's something else you have to do, and it's it's it. You have to get the the cognitive brain is not the only uh, resource that is um, to the truth. I mean, and I think that's what Kierkegaard is really saying. He's, he's saying truth is subjectivity. Truth is about how I am emotionally and personally and um, my body and my actions, how that relates to God, right? It, it's, it's not I can affirm, I can say X, Y, and Z is true. And if it's true, then I'm good. Then you're, you know, he, I mean, he even argues about how, suggests that the pagan who thinks God is, you know, in the big, I don't know, in the big purple bird, um, but that everything about God is, you know, that he believes it with passion and love and this bird brings joy and this bird brings um, tidings of good, you know, something to hope for. Um, it has to do with the end of the, with the pagan. He calls him a pagan. I didn't mean what by pagan, what we mean yeah. by pagan, but um, it's the love that that pagan has. Sorry. Um, it's that love. The pagan has the passion. The pagan has uh, for what it is. He thinks is ultimate or she thinks is ultimate as opposed to the Christian that is affirm you know, can affirm um, the creed or maybe even memorize the creed, but doesn't, it doesn't mean anything. Like it's not, it's, it's all yeah. objective reality out mm -hmm. there. It's not a really a part of me. So, you know, like maybe if you can affirm the whole creed without crossing your fingers, but have not loved, it's just like a banging gong. Yep. So, so like with that type of kind of investment, are, are, are kind of awareness that, uh, of the nature of faith that you get in Kierkegaard. Um, but, like how does that shape impact the way you engage in kind of process theological reflection? Cause I mean, not, that we have to go into process people debating its relationship with existentialism, but, um, but more like that the process uh, and, and you, br you bring this out really well in the, in the, um, you know, collection of different feminist process voices, the, the book that um, you edited. Uh, and I, I use it when I taught process, uh, when I process, process theology class. Oh, thank is it, you. is it, um, you know, the popular, especially by people that don't like process version of process is the white philosopher male uh, explaining the problem of evil as the entry point for you know, process thought. Uh, um, and, so, and, and, and y'all in the book, you expand with all these kind of like different trajectories into uh, process thought. And then the way in which the lived experience of different uh, female uh, theologians and the communities they come from uh, kind of uh, really, uh, I don't know, it gives a, a whole different depth uh, to, you know, the kind of rehearsed introductions that take place in uh theology classes. Yeah. Uh, and I'm, I'm going to make a statement that it's not absolute, but I think it, in my experience, it's common enough that I think it's worth exploring and saying, and that is that most of the men that I know that like process uh, or are process thinkers um, come to it because there's a problem, usually it has to do with this problem of evil that they can't get their head around using non-process theology that they, it just, it, it's a barrier to them. Um, and so when they get to process theology uh, or, you know, the, this question of evil, how can God be good and evil and evil exist and gets them into 
binds. And process offers a way of thinking about that in a different way. But most of the, so it solves a problem for them, right? It, it solves something that they, it, it gives voice and explanation to something that they have felt is not answerable in the system of thinking that they have adopted. And now they have a different system of thinking that makes it more sense, makes more sense to them, particularly about that issue. Whereas the women that I have talked to, and this includes Marjorie and Merritt and I think my friend Kathy who passed a while ago and Nancy and um, my students as well. It's more like, oh, this is the way I've always thought things were. I just didn't have the articulation, right? The question of evil doesn't isn't the main point. The question of solving a problem that that theology didn't solve isn't the main point. The main point is, oh, this makes so much more um, sense to my experience and to my um, unarticulated, previously unarticulated um, sense of what reality and God and holiness is about. And I think that's a really powerful uh, motivator and a powerful statement about the the importance and appeal of process theology for women in particular. Does that so, answer your question? Yeah, and and I, I mean, well, I'd like for you to kind of expand it and share, like, um, maybe what are a, is a trajectory of two that does that, or like, what are the ways uh, a kind of process feminism gives uh, the process part gives a more systemic, philosophical, scientifically engaged, um, uh, affir affirming of deep subjectivity and these type of things uh, to the, the intuitions and the ethical desires of feminism. Yes. Well, I think the, the, the relationality, the depth of reality as being about relationship and about connection is something that I think a lot of women and I think men too, but you know, I, I'm not in men's mind, so I don't know, but um, it's, it, it's, it's what's true. Like it's so clear that everything is related to everything else and you can't separate things out. I mean, we want to separate things out. We're Americans. We want to separate things out. We think of individuals are responsible for this and this is what we do and this is that. And you know, the whole question we're dealing with right now, not to bring up politics, but, you know, who do you hold responsible for what's going or what for the what happened in um, at the Capitol? Um, yes, certainly the individuals who were doing the actions, but there was a whole bunch of other stuff going on there. And I don't know when you if you've ever been in a situation where you're in a group of people and there and there's a there's a couple people that are leading, you kind of follow them or it's difficult to not follow them, or it's easy to follow them, even if you don't even know what you're doing. I mean, I can imagine, um, not myself, because I have particularly strong, um, uh, even though I'm pretty uh, liberal politically and uh, left of, much left of center than most, uh, I still have very clear and um, it's the right word. I hold the, val the, the values of the constitution and the declaration of independence very high, very highly. And I have a sort of almost civil religion, I would say not almost, but definitely have civil religion experiences and expressions of the institutions that are in Washington, DC, like the Capitol. Like that to me is, it's a, it's a symbol. And, you know, I'm a Talikian about symbols. There's something really going on there. It's not just, some people said this should be something that, you know, is like a, a sign for the humans, I mean, the people's um, voice, but rather there's a, there's a powerful energy um, in, in that, in my mind, um, not just for me, but for a lot of people, but, that the people's voice is is symbolized. I mean, it's literally literally there, but it's also symbolized in the Capitol building. And to think that somebody would storm it and leave their crash and 
crap and break the windows and break the doors. And I, it feels, I, I, I'm I probably shouldn't talk about it because it's, it's very emotionally powerful for me and it mm-hmm. really makes me mad. Um, and I forgot the question now. <laughs> oh, no, just the, <laughs> no, I, mean, I, I definitely think that there is a, uh, um, uh, I mean, you were talking about the way about the symbolic element and I, and I think that's true. Um, it was a, I can't remember what you said at the beginning, but that, uh, you know, one, one response is to look at the actors and then go and put responsibility just on the actor. Mm-hmm. Right. And, and I think that obviously like in one sense that you are responsible in some way for what it is you do, but one of the things a process vision helps with is a way in which any particular act of localization of an issue, if I locate it in the other in any way or some substance, that type of substance-based thinking around problems mm-hmm. um, is a way of avoiding uh, the responsibility of the whole network of relations, right? And so um, – uh, the, like I kind of had both those thoughts. You kind of brought both of them up in different ways. One, like in what ways are we contributing to a public sphere and a nation, I communal identity such that, that the, what we're pointing at as a problem is an expression of our whole nation's relationship with each other, right? Like uh, it, we don't want to abstract them out of us and then blame them and just put all the responsibility on them because we're all a part of the same network. And then what they do, it connects to the symbolic register and it, it functions symbolically, I think for, um, in, 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 and you can see even in uh, adventure of ideas, how this function when Whitehead talks about the way in which, um, uh, you know, process persons are properly conservative when you conserve the right things. And when you look at the problems facing our world, the last thing we really, really want if we're going to address global crises is undercutting and undermining even our ability to cooperate together at the nation state level. Yeah, And so uh, it functions as a symbol because it is the place in which we've been kind of where – you know, you come and reason together or whatever way you want to talk about it. Not that we can't all be cynical about it the whole time we're voting and things, but it functions symbolically as the promise of that, which we hope to get better at doing over yeah. time. Yeah. The same way of like, uh, um, I, I was doing counseling with, when I was a minister with a couple and the, uh, husband had known his wife was cheating, but when he realized she took off her wedding ring before they left the house, that's when he had to interrupt her about it. Because, huh. like, that is, I'm setting this aside, you know? And it's nothing, had, it wasn't like that reality wasn't there. It was just that symbolic break yeah. said, we're really in a different place now. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I think, I, I think you're correct. Um, and it's interesting that your, your focus is on the response of the ethical responsibility. And I wouldn't deny that. But my focus is also on the damage Mm -hmm. and harm of part of the body violating the other part of the body. Um, It that's, that's what I think is so uh, harsh to me um, experientially and the depth of that relationality. I'm not in Washington, DC, right? I haven't been in Washington, D.C. for since the last time AAR was in Washington, D.C. Uh, but I still feel that violation. Um, I feel the fear and the violation of our uh, the people that were elected, um, some of which, you know, I'd like to, what are you thinking, um, myself, but to violate that, it, it was like it violated the body. The whole body was violated. That's what it feels like to me. Um, and that's very process in the sense, I mean, we're all connected. I mean, we're connected beyond the country, but particularly those folks that we're supposedly, um, have common, not just that they're close to us 
physically because they're in states or uh, countries, I mean, not countries, uh, counties or um, cities that are close to us, but because we're of, of one country and we're supposed to therefore have some kind of common value, common claims about what is important. Um, and that feels like it was violated intellectually, but emotionally it feels, I mean, there's something else going on there that was violated as well, I guess. And that seems to me to be the feminist version. And maybe that's not a great example of it, but the feminist version is that this, this, this connection that we have with each other is below the surface. It's below our ability to simply talk about or make external cognitive connections. Um, when I, when I when I teach process theology, sometimes what I do is I have a yarn, right? And I, you know, I'm going to hold on to the yarn, and then I'm going to give the ball of yarn to this person, and they're going to give it to that person, and and it goes all over the place, right? And then we try to move. Go ahead, try to move. I say, and every time some one person moves, the people around them are going to have to move too. And then what if you don't want to move? Well, now there's all kinds of stuff happening here. And that's affecting the whole room. And that's, I think, is the process. That's a uh, a symbol or so- sign or metaphor or an example of how the connectedness of process, the, of the relational worldview, um, and particularly when we're talking about what our values are. Um, mm-hmm. Those are our really deep, the deep connections. Yeah, that's, you know, and before we started recording, you mentioned um... – yeah, this semester that you're doing a class on uh, trauma, and, yeah. um, and and that's not surprising for a process thinker. You mentioned when you went in to start your PhD, you were thinking of doing the way theology connects with you know uh, psychology, pastoral care, and such. Um, people that don't know you don't know you're also a yoga teacher, which you're about to go do after that after we get done. Yep. Um, so when maybe you can talk about the way you understand um, uh, process connecting to that desire for embodiment and attending to uh, your, your body and also how that connects to attending uh, to trauma. Like how does your process theological framework help you understand what's getting itself done in kind of a a growing awareness of our embodied space in the West and then um, the reality of affect and trauma and things. Yeah, that's a really, that's a lot of questions there. So let me start with one. Um, so I'm teaching the uh, the seminar on trauma and theology, which at Christian Theological Seminary. Yes, at Christian in Theological Indianapolis. Indianapolis, and I've got um um I've got a lot of masters of theological students in it, but I have a representative from every single degree program that we offer, except the PhD program, taking the class. So that'll be interesting to have all these different perspectives on it. Uh, you know, we've got two counseling programs as well, and we have a DMEN program. So um, the counseling program, you know, they're going to have a very different view of trauma, perhaps, than some of the theology folks will have, or the MDiv folks will have. Um, so the the question of trauma, I think theology needs to address trauma. And um, because it's so pervasive, and it's not just that it's pervasive because of of Trump or because of COVID, but those things have made it more intense in people's or more conscious in people's experience, I think. Uh, But trauma is, particularly the trauma that we're talking about is stuff, is something that occurs that it's not just little T trauma, but rather capital T trauma, something that occurs to you and your reaction to it is that it's overwhelming. You don't have a place to put it in your cognitive part of your brain to make any sense out of it. And so it gets stuck in a part of the brain that's precognitive, uh, that is flooded with um, emotional, intense um, chemicals, um, not the chemicals that are having their emotional intense, but when you have an emotion, intense emotional experience, you get these certain chemicals that then kind of isolate the kind of like creates a moat around which that experience recurs when it gets triggered, when something, you know, when a pebble plops in it, then it, it recurs. And what's interesting, there's two things that are really interesting about that. One is that 
it's it doesn't change. So, you know, most memories that you have that you're conscious of, you know, like for instance, trip, you can remember when you were in San Diego with me and um, Jeremy uh, more than a year ago uh, at the AAR. And you can have a, a memory of that, of taking me taking pictures of you guys oh, by the water and the water coming in. So we were north of San Diego we were where we had actual waves and you can remember that. But every time you remember it, you change it slightly because it's still in your conscious memory. Whereas the trauma never gets changed. Like it's just as a, it's like a feedback loop that gets stuck. Um, and when you're in it, you might not actually be all that, aware of the other part of your life um would you, like- would you oh sorry uh the, I, I so in when you're thinking of trauma in a process context would you say like in every moment we receive the past and then there's you know this thin layer at the top of the past that we're conscious of right that we're receiving and then we have some agency as to how we relate to that prehension Right, or the past coming to be. Um, but part of the what it sounds like uh, that you're talking about of trauma, where there's like this kind of uh, a, a rut or a moat where the, the, the pain is rubbed in, is it? it's not only doesn't come to the surface, uh, so you aren't conscious of it, where you can try to process it in the sense of relating to it differently. Um, but it's like dug this road, so it's now like – a, one of the more powerful energies coming into each moment, especially when that 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 particular event or that particular moment's uh, prehension has parallels to it, right? Where you where your mood in engaging the world is similar to that which is in the trauma. Then there's this energy that is totally coming into the moment. It's just so often we uh, project onto our stream of consciousness we're aware of the totality of what impacts us and trauma is a way of talking about uh, the way we're knit together moment by moment. Um, And the past is with us, whether or not, you know, we uh, are are, are conscious of it. So, yeah. And so the trauma is a, is like a little moat that is separated from the other relatedness. Right. That's a really good image. You should be a teacher. I think your mom's right. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah with my little stuffed animals yeah um and but so the 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 goal is to try to in some way open up the moat so that the experience can be um integrated into your conscious and intentional life so one of the things that one of the problems with the way that theology sometimes addresses these issues, not process, but other theologies, is that it wants to say that um, my bird came to visit. Uh, It wants to say that God, just give it over to God, right? Or, you know, be open to Jesus's healing. What if you Uh, fill the moat with Jesus's blood, Helene? Have you thought about that? Yeah, exactly. So, and that is the opposite of helpful. Oh, for a person suffering from trauma, because that's not going to help. That's just substituting one uh, abuser or trauma trauma experience for another. So, there has to be a way in which we can talk about God that is empowering rather than taking than giving us than us giving over the power and saying god heal me i can't fix it right but rather something inside me something that i can do something that i can do with another person i can be helped by another person i can be heard i can be listened to i can um so there's a variety of different approaches that the trauma experts are working on that are nonverbal that aren't about, let's talk about that experience again. Um, but rather there's, I mean, even just there's do this, this at rapid eye movement, which is really interesting where you're following some uh, finger and the person who's there is helpful in the sense of um, the witness sees this, 
and yes or no. I mean, there's, there's very little direction. Um, yoga is actually really helpful, speaking of yoga. Um, and Bessel van der Kolk, one of the uh, premier trauma experts, started a yoga and trauma program years ago. And um, actually, David Emerson um, had the idea, and he's really kind of the expert that began it. And then there's a lot of folks that have engaged it as well, including myself. Um, and it's because the yoga is using the breath. So, so one of the things that happens in the trauma is that we st- we start breathing weirdly, because if you get reactivated, you if you have a trauma um, injury and then it something clicks and you get reactivated, where you go into that moat, then the breathing usually becomes short and shallow. Um, so intentionally. Now, the, the breathing is such so interesting because it's both conscious and unconscious. Like, you're probably breathing even though you haven't been conscious of breathing right now. Well, till you mentioned it. Yeah. You know. Yeah. But once then I, I was like, I'm still breathing, right? <laughs> yeah. Right. So that means it wor- it's go- It's working unconsciously. And so in an odd way, it's, it's a part, it, it has access to the part of the brain um, that is both conscious and unconscious in some ways. Um and so now, now when I can try to control it, I can slow down those exhales. And that lets the moat, the moat's like this, right? It's got nice high fences. Nothing's going to get in here. But that lets the moat, the fences come down. And then if I can start to experience that, and I can experience it in my body, like usually with what happens with um, with yoga, and this happens even if you're not talking about trauma, right? People have different parts of their body that are sore. Oh, I can't do that on this side. I can do it on this side. And I'm not talking about 25-year-olds. I'm talking about people as they get older. Um, the the We get caught. You know, we just, get, you know, we'll start to do uh, a movement and this shoulder doesn't go up as high as that shoulder. Um, you know, or this hand isn't as wide as that hand, or this hip feels sore and that one's oh, fine. And you just start to notice those things and then breathe into them. And that actually helps access the moat. It helps you access the moat. And once you can access the moat with consciously, then you can decide what to do about those experiences. Now, it might take a bit. You might take a while of doing that. Um, but it's, it's a powerful, um, in, instrument. And the other thing about the, the yoga that can be helpful with trauma is that there is a spiritual dimension to yoga, the connection with the breath, the connection with the deeper part of the self. Um, and, um, the movement itself is helpful. So it's not just, I'm getting in a position that I can feel my body in this way. It's that there's a movement and that movement helps things flow at the energy flow um, and not get stuck. You you know, one of the things that strikes me in your description and uh, both of the trauma and the yoga is something that I think if you're familiar with process, you're like, obviously, but isn't always the case. A lot of Christian theologies or any Western uh, account of the self, even non-religious ones, think of humans as like brains on a stick. And um, uh, and not only is the process worldview one that thinks about uh, embodied relationality and affirmation of deep subjectivity across all uh, living things, but that in those moments of living, is the very gift of possibility from God, right? So what people sometimes, and you earlier talked about how feminist process uh, theologians have gone have discovered process and said, yeah, okay, there, that sounds like the good news I already knew was good. I just need the language for it It is in part because, um, I mean, there's lots of reasons for this, but uh, in the West, at least, uh, men uh, suffer historically from a higher degree of alienation uh, from embodied awareness uh, and the hyper-rationalization and all these other types of things. So uh, trauma, reflecting on that, yoga, 
but also um, valorizing care for your neighbor and things like that. You can see in um, uh, developmental psych in comparing uh, large uh, amounts of uh, female females and men in, in the West. But all, all that to say, I think that they're uh, one of the gifts of a process uh, vision is it says that these intuitions that exist are not just a, a more rich account of being human. It's a deeper account of the possibilities of the presence and a uh, gift of possibility from God. Yes, that's very well said. And, and I think that the process perspective on thinking about theology, a theological, a process theological perspective on thinking about trauma is much more helpful than some of the other approaches that are, uh, that I've read, and they're they're striving to uh, when they're talking about the trauma to be really attentive and um, open to different people's experience and trying to understand it and being compassionate. But when it comes when push comes to shove, it, if God is in charge, potent period, then there's no way out of that the trauma. Uh, I mean it. it so, so an experience of trauma is not fixed or helped by having somebody else come and yank you out. It, it just doesn't, it doesn't work. It doesn't work. It doesn't work if it's a doctor. It doesn't work if it's um, a wife. It doesn't work if it's a buddy. It doesn't work if it's God, right? The, wow. the trauma has to be the moat, right? The moat has to have to, the, 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 the things that keep the moat in there have to be released. They have to come down. Now, um, other people can help, right? I can listen. And there can be different techniques that kind of bypass the cognitive, the, the part of the, the brain that's trying to be cognitively in control. Um, but the the divine within, the, 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 the process view of God as being within us at all times, I mean, God is within us and God is beyond us, but God's bidding us and God doesn't, doesn't force us or, uh, you know, it's like, I can't, I can't pray. God, bring me out of this situation. That's not process, right? Process can, you know, you can pray for God's, God's presence and help, but that is being coming more aware of the fact that God is already present and, Maybe there's um, some discernment going on there um, and also an awareness, a deeper awareness of the interconnectedness of the elements of the self, God and people, other, other entities include, I shouldn't say just people, but wait, what are you doing there? Um, sorry, the bird is getting into trouble. Um, but also other creatures, including birds, as well as nature itself. Yeah. Oh, that's okay. This is a lot of fun. I know you have to go get ready for your yoga class. So hopefully we can uh, pick it up after you taught the class. Yeah. Like because of you know, the different programs of CTS, having future ministers, future counselors, then people doing their D men from different helping professions uh, with bringing the experience of different communities there. Yeah. Um, I can imagine a process person teaching this as like a giant laboratory to get, uh, to to try out ideas with people that can share the wisdom of different communities and people. So, um, when when the semester's over, we should we should do a deep dive into process and and trauma and see what uh, what all the insights you gained. Yeah, yeah, I'd like that. Awesome. Well, it's really nice chatting with you, dear, and your Hobbit hole. Oh yeah, I um you you know. Um, it's, it's, uh, the wonderful gift of zoom is that I, I can have Helene Russell talk to me about theology in my basement till 1030 in Scotland. And, <laughs> <laughs> and so if you're enjoying the conversation and looking, uh, for a place to do theological education, make sure you check out Christian theological seminary in Indiana, uh, Indianapolis, Indianapolis. Um, and, and, um, you know, there's there's online options and all that, and I'll be I'll put links and everything on the uh, web page to that, along with um, uh, you know the different books from well the the Helene helped edit around all the different process women uh, voices to Kierkegaard Tillich and all that kind of stuff. All right, that sounds great. It's good to see you. Great to chat with you, dear. 
Awesome. All right. Well, I, I hope you have fun. Okay. Okay. Bye. Okay. Bye.